In 2012, two families left the city along with the conveniences of modern American living. Today, our family has decided to live in the mountains of the American Ozarks to build for themselves a more sustainable and fulfilling lifestyle. We are an American homestead! This week on American Homestead, it looks like we're going to have a great harvest of garlic this year. Plus, Jamie gives you one of our favorite garlic recipes. Thanks for watching, and be sure to visit us online at anamericanhomestead.com. things that we have been trying to do for our sawmill is build a covering over the top of it and what you see here is one of the posts that I'm going to cut down so that I can build that covering. Uh, we're going to have a number of uh, corner posts uh, to build this shelter over the top of our sawmill. I need at least 14 good sized posts just like this one and so we've been cutting these down on a pretty regular basis uh, so that we can build the shelter over the sawmill and this is one that I'm going to go ahead and take down. Now if you notice it's right next to our solar dehydrator and our uh, little office camper here that we have and um, I don't think the outhouse is in too much danger but this definitely is because it's leaning this way and so what I got to do folks is tie a tow cable here to this tree and to our little Toyota pickup which is off camera right now and then kind of pull it this way so that when I cut it it doesn't fall on the solar dehydrator so we're going to go ahead and see what we can do on that. So we're taking down lots of cedar posts just like that, uh, getting the shelter or pavilion built over the top of the sawmill uh, that you saw in the previous episode. And so we'll give you some more uh, details on that as it gets built. So kind of excited about it. Uh, but this chainsaw, let me give you a quick tip, uh, something I learned recently. Uh, we use this chainsaw quite a bit. We have another chainsaw that we use. It's a little bit smaller that we use more for brush. This is our go-to chainsaw that, uh, you know, when I want to take down a tree, this is the one I pick up. Um, it's a steel, I believe it's a 305, the little label fell off, or 306 or something, uh, but the label fell off. It's an awesome chainsaw. It works every time I need it to and uh, just performs really well. But the other day, it started giving me problems. I would start it up and it would die and uh, just was not uh, performing correctly. All of a sudden, after three years of owning this and using it on a pretty regular basis, it just stopped running. And I was telling my neighbor about it and he said, well, I know what the problem is. And he told me to open up the fuel uh, right here and take out the little fuel filter that's inside. It's connected to a little bit of a line, a fuel line, and you pop that off and you replace it. And he said the reason that you have to replace it is because of the ethanol inside of the fuel that you buy that you're using for the mixture for the chainsaw. Uh, for this particular chainsaw and many other chainsaws, it's a 50 to 1 mix, oil to gas mix, and it's the ethanol in, to, in the modern gasolines today that are, that are basically clogging up this fuel filter. At least that's what he said. Um, and sure enough, I went to the store, paid like $6 for a new one, put it inside of the fuel, took the old one out, which is this one, put the new one in, and filled it up with fuel, and it started up just like new.
So if you're having problems with your chainsaw, it's not acting the way it normally once did when you first bought it, uh, chances are it could be this little fuel filter just like this. It costs a few dollars at the store. You replace it, and it'll start up. And it's been working great ever since. So there's my chainsaw tip for you guys. Um, just something to throw in there. To, you know, Maybe you guys are having issues with your chainsaw. Sometimes we use ours a lot. And the first time I've ever had a problem, and that was the solution, just replace that little oil filter. So there you go. So it is time to harvest some garlic. And this is my garlic patch. Uh, the tops are starting to turn brown, so we're gonna go ahead and pull some of these up. We planted these in the, in the winter time, and uh, they have grown pretty well. There's some, definitely some big bulbs of garlic in here. And uh, you know, I just tried to, I, I wanted to experiment because you know, there's different places online that specialize in selling you garlic to plant. And you know what I did? I just went to the store I bought a few bulbs of garlic and I just took them apart and put them in the ground and just to see what would happen. And uh, it turns out they've done really well. There's some pretty big bulbs in here. And so what we're going to do is harvest these, uh, let them dry out today. Uh, it's in the morning right now. Sun's coming up. It's starting to, the heat's starting to turn on. It's been hot in the Ozarks the last couple of days. And uh, we're just going to let them dry out uh, for the day. And then tomorrow we're going to go ahead and braid them. And then I think we're going to show you a really neat recipe that me and Jamie love uh, to make with garlic. So uh, let's go ahead and pull these out of the ground. And you might notice that there's some volunteer cabbage plants and even a couple of volunteer baby tomatoes that are coming up right here uh, because we've had other things. Uh, I think we spilled some cabbage seed over here last year. Uh, and it's coming up on its own. And then this has kind of been an area where we've had baby tomatoes in the past and they're coming up. Some of the tomatoes fell off in the ground and now the seeds are sprouting and coming up. So by clearing out this garlic, we'll go ahead and cage these upcoming tomato plants and maybe allow and see what happens with these uh, uh, cabbages. That They'll probably come up as well. So let's go ahead and pull these up and uh, we'll show you what we got. Here's the garlic. Uh, it's out of the garden and uh, there's some big ones and some small ones and we're going to braid these and get them cleaned up and set up in the kitchen. But first they need to dry. We'll sit them in the sun today uh, on the back porch and then uh, tomorrow hopefully we'll get these braided. Hey guys, I'm out here with my tomatoes in my garden today, and boy, it is hot. It hasn't rained in like a week, and um, woo, boy. And so I'm just coming out here, and I'm uh, sometimes these tomato vines are, I mean, this was working really well. If you remember in some earlier videos, I was putting these cattle panels up uh, to weave in and out these uh, tomato vines as they grew in and out of the, the, the cattle panels. And uh, I know some people were kind of skeptical if this would work well, but so far this is working really well, just weaving these guys in and out. Because after all, a tomato, all a tomato is is just a vine. So give the vine uh, some, 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 something to grab onto and to just grow up into. And these don't have like uh, the tentacles that, that wrap around things. You know, tomatoes don't have that, but they will weave in and out really easily in these cattle panels, and it's working out really well. <clears throat> There's another lady who works in, who's in town, I, I know, and she does this with her, her, her and her husband do this with, with their garden, where they weave the tomatoes in and out of the cattle panels. And I have tomato cages that I've been using, but so far this has been working out, I think, a lot better. And uh, once they do get over the top, um, I can then weave them in and out alongside or back and down. I mean, they can just keep weaving in and out as I work with them and harvest my tomatoes. Uh, you know, and, and pulling out the suckers here and there as I go. Um, but, uh, you know, people who are wondering about the, the cattle panels, it does work out really, really well. I wanted to show you something. Uh, else another garden tip that I have found uh, works amazingly well and if you notice what we have here on the ground is 
uh, wheat straw. I'm using wheat straw. There's very little seed in it. You don't want to use hay because hay contains a lot of grass seed and you know, you'll get a lot of weeds in your garden. But this has been working out really well for keeping the weeds down in the garden. As you can see, every once in a while a weed will pop up. Um, you just pull it out uh, and, and let it sit in the sun and it'll, it'll die. But this has been working really well uh, to keep the weeds down, but it also provides another, another amazing benefit. And that's what I wanted to share with you uh, here. And let's go take a look at this. Now it is hot. It has not rained here in over a week. And it's been up in the 90s, heat index of 110, 108, 103. And I'm telling you, it is dry on top of this. And it's okay, this stuff is all dry, but when you move this aside, you dig down into here, you hit what you have is moist, dark soil. This is very moist. This is great for plants. And, and I mean, this makes all the difference in the world. Folks, you know, one of the things that drives me nuts is when I see people who just have their gardens and, and they're planting their plants in dirt. It's like nails on a chalkboard to me because when it goes two or three, four weeks, a whole month of no rain, this is still going to be moist soil underneath all of this wheat straw. And your plants are going to continue to be able to use the nutrients uh, and, and the moisture underneath all of this when it hasn't rained in over a month. And so, folks, I can't one of the, if you can watch our videos and just glean one piece of advice is to put a covering over your garden so that the, the moisture where all the nutrients are, the, the dirt where all the nutrients are, will stay moist and allow your plants to continue to grow. So uh, keep that in mind when you're plant, planting, a, planting a garden and growing your plants, uh, especially in the summer where it may not rain for you know, weeks on end. This is one of the best way to keep getting productivity out of your garden is to put a covering on top of it. And you know what? You don't have to till your soil when you do this. You just keep putting new layers upon layers on top of your garden at, during the course of the year and the nutrients will continue to break down. So on top of all of this wheat straw uh, come this fall and winter, I'll be putting more wood chips and then in the spring right before planting or maybe about a month or so before planting in the early spring or late winter, I'll put on another layer of this wheat straw um, that's widely available for very cheap where I live. You can pick up these bales and I just unroll them on the garden and that just does an amazing job of holding that moisture in. So if, if you take away one tip, this is it folks. This will keep your plants growing so that you have that amazingly rich uh, moist soil underneath that your plants can use to grow with. We still have our guineas, and we've talked about why they're so important on our homestead. Uh, they take really good care of the ticks. You know, they say that one guinea will clear an acre of ticks. Uh, we've lost quite a few of them over the winter. We're down to our last two pair. But fortunately, the, uh, the hen started laying her eggs out in the bush, and I found her nest. So what I did is when I started taking the eggs, I put golf balls in exchange. So she would still be encouraged to lay her eggs in the same location because she thinks there's something in the nest. And so I just had a half a dozen or so golf balls for her to, to have a nest with. And then I'd just take her egg every day and I'd save them. And as the hens, our chicken hens started to uh, brood, I put the guinea eggs underneath the chicken hens. So, so far we've had about 10 guineas that have hatched. They're just little tiny things. They're just not so big. But I'm really pleased we've had a good production of guineas. Restock our supply. It's almost living out here in the woods like this. Guineas are almost an expendable commodity because they roost in the trees and there's so many predators. It's a dangerous place out there at night. And the owls get them and the raccoons and so we'll expect to lose a half a dozen or more just from the predators that come along throughout the rest of the summer and then in the winter it's really a bad time for the guineas but uh, we've got a good start and I'm pleased we've had so many guineas that have been hatched. Okay. This is the nest where the guineas were laying their eggs so I put golf balls there uh, there used to be more golf balls, but they've uh, kind of disappeared. I s suspect that a snake came along and thinking they had an egg, 
they swallow the golf ball. So I also have it, you notice there's a chicken egg there too, so we have one of our chickens that lays. I use the golf balls to encourage them to lay the egg at the same same place every time so they don't move their nest. Snake ate the golf ball. Hello, I have all these bulbs of garlic in front of me that Zach brought in from the garden. I love cooking with garlic. I really feel like garlic makes everything taste better. So I always have purchased a lot of garlic because we've never successfully grown it on our own. But now I have a lot of bulbs of garlic that I'm going to be braiding today and hanging up in my kitchen so I can cut off a bulb whenever I want to use it. Okay, all right. So I have some garlic right here. I'm starting with three. I have a big one in the middle and two smaller ones on the side. And I've raised this up just so the little ones nest right there on the side. And then I have this twist tie. It's actually just two twist ties twisted together. And I'm gonna tie them together so that they're stable to get me started. Okay, so now I have three, and I'm just going to go ahead and get started braiding. I have some different sizes of garlic that I'm going to do. I'm going to do the big ones in the middle, and the little ones will be down the side. So I'm going to take a big one, and I'm going to add it to the middle, just like that, so it lines up with my middle. Then I'm going to take my right one, put it over, just like braiding. And then I'm gonna take a smaller one. Okay, right, so I'm going to add the small one to the right side. And every time I add a bulb of garlic, I'm gonna line the stem up down the middle so it's always lined up with my middle. Then I'm bring my left side over. And I'm gonna add another small one to my left side so that it's lined up down the middle. Now I'll bring my right side over. And then the next one I'm gonna do is a big one. Oops, I'm gonna trim that one. The next one I'm gonna do is a big one. And put that right down the center. So now I'm back to the beginning again. I'm gonna take my right side, bring it over, and I'm going to choose a smaller bulb, add it right there. Now the left side comes over, now I'm just going to keep braiding until this is as long as I want, I'm just going to keep adding garlic to the right, left, middle just as I go all the way down. Okay, when you're finished braiding down as far as you wanna go, you're gonna take your twine and just tie off your end. I'm gonna turn mine over and tie it from the back and just make a loop so that I can hang it from a hook in my kitchen. All right, there you go. Looks okay for my first attempt. <laughs> so now I wanna show you a recipe that Zach and I have been eating for our entire married life. It's one of our very favorite garlic dishes. So this is our fresh garlic that just came in from the garden. I'm gonna trim off the roots. Okay, this is a recipe for baked garlic. And if you've never had it, you're in for a real treat. 
So what I'm going to do is just cut off the top. I cut into some of the cloves to expose the top of some of the cloves. And then you're going to set it in your pan. This is um, this is just a saucepan, but it can go in the oven as well. You want a pan or a baking dish, something like that, that can go in the oven. And I'm going to do that with all the rest of them so that I fill up my pan here. So then I'm just going to drizzle the tops with a little bit of olive oil. Just so it goes down between the cloves a little bit. And then I always like to put a little bit of water just in the bottom of the pan. Not above the garlic, but just enough water in the bottom of the pan. That keeps it moist so that the garlic doesn't get dry. And then it's ready to go in the oven. So you can tell when it's done because the edges are browned and the inside garlic cloves are soft. So I hope this inspires you to grow garlic in your own garden. If you don't have any growing right now, plan to plant them in the fall. You'll plant your garlic cloves and then by this time next spring, you'll have garlic hanging in your kitchen. tuning in again this week. Please subscribe and share us on Facebook. See you next time on American Homestead. what's on camera okay and the edge of the camera is right here so you can go as far over as there so okay here to there all right go ahead okay mm -hmm. the, other, the other day we had quite a surprise a chicken laid an egg that has got to be the biggest chicken egg i have ever seen it weighs a full four ounces it is just huge I haven't cracked i'm sure it's a double yoker it may even be a triple i don't know yeah We'll have to see. But in comparison, there's a turkey egg. It's bigger than a turkey egg. And then there's a normal large chicken egg. And then there's a, a guinea egg just for comparison. But that is just a huge egg coming from a chicken.